At Balchem Animal Nutrition and Health, we strive every day to deliver results you can see in your animal's productivity and your bottom line. From a smooth transition into the milking string for your fresh cows, to a happy welcome home from your furry friend. From a strong start in your poultry flock, to consistent weight gains for your finishing hogs. We expect to earn your business and your trust with our people, our products, and our science. Our people have an intense passion for your animals and your success. You can count on us for honest, candid advice and practical solutions for your toughest challenges. As the global leader in choline production, chelation, and encapsulation technology, we take our obligation to you and to the environment seriously. Our products are backed by the most extensive and thorough research portfolio, while our business is committed to advancing environmental sustainability and animal welfare. In the end, it all comes down to results. Balchem delivers real results you can count on, results that exceed your expectations, and results that bring true value to your bottom line. Leading the charge to meet the nutritional needs of ruminants, monogastrics, and companion animals, Balchem offers a growing portfolio of nutritional products and a dedication to innovation and industry sustainability. Balchem is here to solve today and shape tomorrow. Five cents might not seem like much, but when it's five cents for every cow, every day, then it really adds up. New AminoSure XM Precision Release Methionine provides the optimal combination of cost, feed stability, rumen stability, and intestinal release to deliver the best cost per unit of available methionine on the market today. Learn how at balchemanh.com slash findyourx. Hello everyone, my name is Scott Sorrell, Director of Global Marketing for Balchem, and welcome to the Real Science Lecture Series. Protein efficiency has long been a topic of discussion in dairy ration balancing due to its impact on ration cost. However, today that conversation is also very important when we layer in the environmental impact of overfeeding protein. In today's Real Science webinar titled, Improving Protein Utilization to Reduce the Environmental Impact of Dairy Production, we will talk about the impact of variable protein levels in diets and how that impacts cow production, cow health, and the environment. Dr. Chris Reynolds from the University of Reading will walk us through the newest research around protein utilization. I would now like to introduce Dr. Chris Reynolds. Dr. Reynolds is currently a professor of animal and dairy science at the University of Reading in the UK and was previously an associate professor of animal science at The Ohio State University. He received his BS degree from the University of Tennessee at Martin and his master's and PhD degrees from the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. Chris's research is focused primarily on the nutritional physiology of ruminants and energy metabolism. Recent research themes include the metabolic and endocrine regulation of appetite, the enhancement of milk and meat fatty acid composition to improve consumer health and reducing the environmental impact of milk and meat production. His current research projects are focusing on reducing nitrogen and methane excretion. Uh, Dr. Reynolds, please take it away. Thank you very much, Scott, and uh, hello, everyone. Uh, wherever you are, uh, I hope you're well, and, and um, I really appreciate you taking time uh, to attend the seminar today, uh, and I appreciate uh, and, and I'm honored to be asked by Balkim uh, to present this webinar. Uh, again, I'm going to be talking about protein utilization in dairy production systems, and some of the data that I'll be presenting today comes from a large long-term collaborative project we conducted in collaboration with Aberystwyth University, SRUC in Scotland, Aberystwyth University in Wales, I should say, and Rothamsted Research in Northwick and Devon. Um, and so I wanted to acknowledge my collaborators on that project at the start of the, of the webinar. When we talk about nitrogen use efficiency in our dairy production systems, uh, the efficiency of dietary nitrogen utilization for milk and meat production is 
relatively low in ruminants compared to non-ruminants like chicken and poultry. And on average, in, an, an, across a number of studies in lactating dairy cows, only about 25% of the dietary nitrogen that a cow consumes is um, uh, excreted as milk uh, or retained in the body as, as, as pro body protein. So that means that 75% of, of dietary nitrogen is excreted in, in uh, manure. And depending on how that manure is uh, managed and how it's, it's uh, utilized, it can result in substantial amounts of volatile nitrogen losses as ammonia. And when we uh, spread the manure on, on, on soil uh, as manure of slurry, then we can have further losses as nitrate, which can, can uh, cause eutrophication of our, of our groundwater and also losses is nitrous oxide, which is a very potent greenhouse gas. And I know uh, there's a lot of concern currently about methane emission from our ruminant production systems, but we also need to be concerned about nitrous oxide because it has a much longer half-life than methane and it's a much stronger greenhouse gas. So these, th this inefficiency uh, where only 25% of our dietary nitrogen is, is retained and 75% and ends up in manure, um, represents a, a loss or, or an inefficiency in terms of uh, the use of purchased feed nitrogen. We also have nitrogen coming into the, our, our production system through nitrogen fertilizer use. Nitrogen fertilizer use has a very uh, substantial energy cost in terms of its production, but it also contributes to losses uh, or emissions as nitrate and nitrous oxide. So one option we have, and I just want to mention this at the start of the talk, is to use legumes in our production systems, especially uh, our forage production systems. They can also contribute to nitrate losses uh, and nitri nitrate uh, nitrous oxide losses, but uh, it reduces our reliance on nitrogen fertilizer and uh, can have benefit for soil health as well. So th these environmental impacts are currently uh, an, an increasing concern for the industry. They're a concern for consumers and for the water public. And we're increasingly seeing more and more legislation related to some of these losses. Um, more uh, ammonia emissions as an air quality concern have been a concern in North America for many years and recently have become uh, legislated here in the UK and uh, with legislation introduced about two years ago. And these le this legislation has had a big impact on dairy farmers, especially in Northern Ireland, who are, who are very concerned about um, their manure management and ammonia losses. So in terms of reducing our environmental impacts and, and, and um, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, a recent survey, this is about five or six years ago, showed that farmers are adopting a lot of practices that help reduce these greenhouse gas emissions. Some of these are related to the use of legumes such as clover and grassland uh, or legumes and crop rotations. And others are related to things like manure uh, management and improve uh, nitrogen fertilizer utilization. But another really important approach we can take is to, uh, is to, to adopt strategies that improve uh, the utilization of our feed nitrogen or protein. And that's the subject of my presentation today. So when we think about this, this nitrogen use efficiency, this gross nitrogen use efficiency, this is milk nitrogen divided by the amount of feed nitrogen that a cow consumes. I mentioned the 25% as an average, but there's actually a fairly substantial range if we look at individual studies that have been published. And Sergio Casamiglia, uh, uh, back as part of the Rednex project, the Reducing Nitrogen Excretion Project, um, he uh, summarized uh, and did a meta-analysis of published data from the US and from the EU. And he showed that the, the range in, in milk nitrogen efficiency was from 22 to 33% in the USA, and there was a similar range in the EU. But one thing to note is that for, uh, that the, the, for the um, studies where there was a higher efficiency, then forage crude protein concentration tended to be lower, so nitrogen intake was, was lower, and milk, nitrogen, milk yield was higher. So cows that were producing more milk protein and had a lower dietary nitrogen had a higher nitrogen use efficiency as you would expect. Johnny Mills here at Reading uh, conducted a meta-analysis of a number of, of uh, 
individual measurements of nitrogen balance in lactating dairy cows. And this was a meta-analysis of almost 2,000 uh, individual observations from these cows. And overall, there was a linear uh, relationship between dietary nitrogen intake and excretion of nitrogen in milk, feces, and urine. But you can see that the rate of increase in milk nitrogen output is less than the increase in fecal nitrogen output, which is even less than the increase in urinary nitrogen output. So what's happening is as, as we increase nitrogen intake of cows, we're, we're tending to feed protein uh, in excess of requirements. And the more protein and amino acids the cow uh, the more protein a cow digests and the more amino acids she absorbs in excess of requirements, the more the amino acids are going to be catabolized and converted to your and the nitrogen converted to urea nitrogen that's, that's excreted in the urine. And that ur urinary urea nitrogen is particularly volatile and contributes substantially to volatile nitrogen losses like ammonia. Looking at that same data, so these are those same data points that John used in that meta-analysis to derive those linear relationships. We see the relationship between milk nitrogen output per unit of nitrogen intake. And so our 25% efficiency is about here. We again, but what we see is that as we increase nitrogen intake, then the efficiency tends to decrease. So one option is to feed less nitrogen. There is, however, for a given level of nitrogen intake, a substantial variation in that efficiency. Now, some of that is undoubtedly due to differences in the type of diet the cows are consumed in the diet formulation and, and the supply of nitrogen or amino acids the cow receives relative to requirements. But there may also be a difference due to the cow. And I'll come back to that later in my presentation about the potential for there being a, a genetic element to nitrogen use efficiency. A few years ago, uh, Jan Dijkstra uh, published a, a paper where we calculated the what we thought would be the theoretical maximal efficiency, taking into account all the biological processes that occur in converting dietary protein and non-protein nitrogen into milk protein. And we estimated that uh, at best for a cow producing 40 kilograms of fat uh, and protein corrected milk, the maximum uh, efficiency would be about 43%. But in most cows and in most studies, we get nowhere near that maximum theoretical, the, theoretical efficiency. So why not feed less protein? Or, or another way of looking at it is why have we been overfeeding protein? And a lot of it gets back to economics, the, the value of protein versus the value of milk yield. And the fact that historically, we've known that by feeding more protein, depending on the type of diet, but we often get an increase in milk yield. The, the, the rate of increase is, is small, so there's diminishing returns, but in some meta-analyses, the maximum milk yield was estimated at 21 to 23% dietary crude protein. And 10 years ago, a lot of our, our high yielding herds here in the UK were feeding very high levels of dietary crude protein. They weren't anywhere near 21 and 23%, but they're a lot higher than they are now. And part of that production response, it tends to be an increase in feed intake that occurs with the increase in dietary protein concentration. And it's related also to effects of dietary protein on rumen fermentation and fiber digestibility. But I think a big, a, a big factor has been um, risk aversion. So the inclusion of extra protein is a safety factor. If you have a group of cows they have an average protein requirement or a requirement for essential, uh, specific essential amino acids. But that, that's an average, and an average is based on a bell-shaped curve. So you know that within that group of cows, you may have some cows that have a higher requirement. So by adding a safety factor, you're making sure you feed enough protein for all the cows in the group. So we need to move towards feeding less protein more precisely, or perhaps feeding protein um, on an individual, uh, based on, on, on individual cow requirements rather than group requirements. Of course, I've been talking about nitrogen, which is how we uh, uh, measure crude protein, but cows don't have a requirement for, for crude protein or nitrogen. They have a requirement for absorbed essential amino acids. And they, we, we know they derive those amino acids from metabolizable protein, which is made up of available rumen undegradable protein that's, that's digested in the small intestine, along with some endogenous protein and also microbial protein. 
And that synthesis of microbial protein is really important. And that's driven by energy ferment, uh, fermentation and energy supply uh, through the fermentation of carbohydrates and, and, and ultimately simple sugars. So it's really about absorbed essential amino acids, but we tend to look at the efficiencies in terms of uh, gross nitrogen intake or, or, or often crude protein. And looking at uh, the, the, the requirement for essential amino acids, there's been a lot of interest in, 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 in recent years, especially because of concerns about environmental impacts in the use of rumen protected essential amino acids alongside lower dietary crude protein concentrations. So formulating diets that have lower crude protein concentration using rumen protected proteins and amino acids to, to ensure we meet the uh, amino acid requirements of the cows. And uh, this is a somewhat uh, uh, old, uh, older uh, meta-analysis uh, by Kevin Sinclair at Nottingham, where he summarized, uh, again, some relatively older uh, literature where d lower crude protein diets had been fed um, with rumen-protected methionine and lysine. And this, this meta-analysis, this figure just shows the, the response of the diets that contain the uh, methionine and lysine compared to those that didn't. And overall, the, the, there was a quite a substantial variation in the response, either positive or negative in some studies. But uh, on average, there was a slight positive uh, benefit of including protected methionine and lysine across all these studies. The importance of amino acid profile was also shown by uh, uh, the, the work that K Kelly Nichols did uh, with Jan Dijkstra and, uh, and Andre Banik at Wageningen University uh, in, in the Netherlands. And in, in this study that Kelly conducted, uh, lactating cows were fed a relatively low dietary crude pro uh, diet crude protein concentration diet, uh, and then infused abomasally um, with varying mixtures of amino acids uh, that would be would have been contained in 562 grams of metabolizable protein. And this is the nitrogen efficiency of those cows uh, comparing to the control with cows that receive these different mixtures of essential amino acids. And we can see that the cows that received all the essential amino acids, they had a higher nitrogen efficiency related to more milk protein yield. Um, but for cows that received just the branch chains alone, they they they, they had lower efficiency. So and 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 Group one amino acids, those amino acids that are secreted by in, in milk proteins in amounts that are equal to the amount taken up by the mammary gland, combined with uh, the branch chains, uh, produced a, a nitrogen efficiency that was very similar uh, and not different to those receiving all the essential amino acids. So this data just illustrates that the profile of essential amino acids provided to the cow does have a big impact on milk nitrogen utilization or dietary nitrogen use efficiency. The impact of energy is also really important, both in terms of fermentation energy and, and, and the synthesis of, metabol uh, of microbial protein, and also post-absorptive uh, post effect of energy uh, on uh, the, the, the metabolism of the cow and the utilization of amino acids. And that's, that's illustrated by these data, also from the Rednex project, uh, which was conducted at, by colleagues in INRA where Jersey cows were fed uh, diets that had two levels of dietary crude protein, either very low at 12% or 16.5%. And then the concentrate uh, fed to these cows either had a high starch concentration or, or a high NDF concentration. So in this case, feeding more starch in the concentrate increased milk nitrogen uh, or milk protein yield, and that increased nitrogen use efficiency from 30 to 32% for the low protein diet and from 24 to 20, almost 29% for the higher protein diet. And this was shown to be due primarily to post-absorptive effects of the starch on amino acid utilization by the cows, rather than a, 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 in addition to any effects the starch had on rumen fermentation and uh, microbial protein synthesis. And again, some of the work of, of Jan Dijkstra students uh, show this effect of net energy supply on uh, milk protein yield. In this case, this was a meta-analysis uh, where uh, there were adjustments made to, to uh, uh, an average metabolizable protein supply. Uh, and you can see that as, uh, as metabolizable protein supply increased, that there was an increase in milk protein yield, but there was a clear effect of energy in terms of when there was more net energy, there was greater milk yield 
and and so uh, the the net energy affected the intercept, but the slope or the the nature of the response was very to metabolizable protein was very similar, but affected by net energy supply. So in terms of dietary protein and and, and milk protein uh, yield or milk production and nitrogen use efficiency, there are numerous, numerous uh, studies in the literature examining the effects of dietary protein supply on animal performance. With the recent concerns over environmental impacts, uh, there have been a lot more studies conducted with lower protein levels. And in practice, uh, uh, producers are feeding much lower protein levels than they were five, 10 to 10 years ago. We know fermentable energy and metabolizable energy or net energy supply to the cow are both important in, in terms of uh, protein efficiency. And that there have been, there's been a lot of interest in feeding lower protein diets alongside rumen protected proteins or essential amino acids such as methionine, lysine, and histidine, uh, who, that have traditionally been considered as, as uh, first limiting. But I just want to highlight that while there's there are literally thousands of these studies published in the literature, most of these studies are very short-term in nature or, short, or, or crossover designs like Latin squares or switchbacks. There are very few studies in the literature that, that are longer term. And this is a concern in terms of dietary adapta adaptation and the, the, the potential role of labile protein pool, pools in the cows in terms of meeting uh, um, protein requirements or amino acid requirements when they're short-term deficiencies. So, because we know that, that, that there's a different response to dietary protein if we go from high to low compared to low to high, the response from, from going from a deficiency to, a, to, to an adequate level of protein occurs very quickly, whereas the response going from adequate to deficient can take quite a, quite a long time to, 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 to reach a plateau. And so uh, we've uh, um, looked in the literature and we've only found about five studies where the effects of dietary protein level on production of dairy cows has been measured over a full lactation or longer. And that's going back to the 1800s in studies that have been published in nutrition textbooks by Armsby. So there's a real lack of some of these long, or there, there was when we first did this lit review, uh, in, in, in lack of long-term studies over entire lactations. And just an example of, of what the, the differential response I'm referring to, this data comes from one of Alex Herstoff's students. Uh, at Pennsylvania State University, where diets were fed that were e either protein, metabolizable protein adequate or deficient. And in one study, uh, the, the study was a Latin square with 28 day periods or a changeover experiment with 28 day periods. And in that case, there was no effect of diet on uh, plasma histidine concentration. But when the, the same diets were fed in a continuous design study for 70 days, then there were the, the metabolizable protein deficient diet resulted in a decrease in plasma histidine concentration. And that wasn't observed in the changeover experiment. One of the studies that has been published uh, was conducted about 10 years ago uh, and published about 10 years ago by, by Ryan Law. It was part of his PhD work at, at AFB in Northern Ireland. And in this case, uh, cows were fed uh, three diets, the either 12, 15, or 18 percent formulated crude protein diets. Uh, these were relatively high grass silage diets, and they were fed uh, to most of the cows over a full lactation. And you can see the effects of the protein level on milk yield of the cows. And in this case, the, the low protein diet was, the, the cow's production was very severely affected. And, and their conclusion was that even the 15% protein diet was not economical because of the loss of protein, uh, of, sorry, the loss of milk yield. But one thing they did observe was that because the cows on the lower protein diets were producing less milk, they had a more positive energy balance in early lactation, and they reached positive energy balance much sooner. And so they hypothesized that this would have benefits or could potentially have benefits in terms of fertility of the cows because the cows were not in, in, in um, negative energy balance for so long in early lactation. So in terms of potential uh, cost or benefits of, of feeding lower protein diets. Potential benefits, obviously reduced environmental impact in terms of through reduced manure nitrogen excretion relative to milk yield. So less land required for, for, for spreading manure, which is becoming an issue here in, in, in certainly in the UK and England. In, pr, pr, a greater uh, efficiency 
through lower protein uh, intakes of the cows and potentially less body um, energy loss is, is a potential benefit that could or was hypothesized to potentially improve fertility, which could also result in reduced culling and more longevity. But the cost would, be, of course, be a reduction in milk yield if, if the amino acid requirements of the cows are not met, and that could impact on profitability. Uh, and there may also be negative effects on fertility through a reduced supply of essential amino acids. So what's not figured into this is the cost or the value of reduced environmental impact. And that's something that, that, that in some way or form may be to, uh, become more of an issue uh, 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 for the industry uh, if there is government legislation, for example, in, in the future. And of course, uh, with, all, with, with any approach involving lower protein diets, diet formulation to make sure we, we meet the uh, nutrient requirements of the cows is, is essential. And so energy source and essential amino acid balance and potentially the use of rumen protected products uh, is gonna be increasingly important. But in terms of uh, the potential effects of feeding lower protein diets in the long term and the potential risk of underfeeding protein, I'd like to provide you with some information from our, a, a very long, term trial that we conducted at the University of Reading. Um, this trial was part of that collaborative project I referred to earlier. The project also involved uh, companion studies at Aberystwyth with cows that were fed uh, higher grass silage diets and also work with growing heifers fed lower protein diets again at Aberystwyth and some demonstration uh, work at SRUC and, and some environmental impact modeling at Rothamsted Northwick. But the study I want to tell you about was conducted here at the University of Reading. And in this study, we were looking at the longer term effects of incremental reductions in protein levels in uh, May silage based diets fed to by UK standards, relatively high yielding cows. The study involved 215 heifers who were enrolled at first calving. Uh, they went, then went on one of three diets that were formulated to have three levels of protein on a crude protein basis that was 14, 16, and 18 percent crude protein. And then they maintained those treatments for three full lactations if they survived uh, for three lactations. We tried to manage, manage the cows as much as possible as a commercial herd. Uh, but they didn't, uh, weren't allowed any grazing when their yields were lower or they were dry. And we, we, we didn't uh, do any phase feeding of protein. We didn't lower the protein concentration of the diet when they were in late lactation. We served them from days 50 to 200 of lactation. If they weren't uh, pregnant by an insemination uh, at 200 days of, of lactation, then they finished the trial at the end of that lactation, even though the, 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 the farm kept many of those cows in the herd. So the diets were relatively simple. They, uh, they, were, they were higher in maize silage, uh, but also contained grass silage and some chopped straw. Uh, and we basically replace a, a, a mixture of soybean meal and rapeseed or canola meal uh, with uh, wheat feed, which is wheat mids, uh, soy hulls, and cracked wheat. So half of the protein we took out of the diet was replaced with starch and half was replaced with NDF. So we took a very simple approach to this and we took a decision not to include any room and protected proteins or amino acids in the diets. And so in terms of metabolizable protein, because we actually formulated the diets on, on, based on metabolizable protein requirements and supply using the, the UK feed into milk system, the uh, optimal diet in this study was the 16% crude protein diet. It was formulated to meet metabolizable protein requirements while the 14% crude protein diet was formulated to provide 90% of predicted requirements for metabolizable protein. So we, we were intentionally underfeeding protein. And our funders wanted us to do this because they were concerned if there was legislation that restricted protein levels, what negative effects there might be if cows were underfed protein. For the higher protein diet, because of fermentable energy uh, restrictions, the amount of metabolizable protein was only 104% of requirement. So the, the higher protein or 18% crude protein diet was, was high in or had excess room and degradable protein. So one of the things we, we spent a lot of time thinking about when we started this very long-term study uh, was how to manage potential variation in diet composition over time. And so we, we, we agreed that we would, uh, we would 
um, take samples of the diet components uh, and composite them weekly and then analyze them for nitrogen uh, using Keldahl analysis in-house and then calculate the crude protein concentration of the diets. And if it varied more than 0.25 percentage units from the target, we would make adjustments to the diet. And this just shows what the uh, actual crude protein concentration of our TMRs would have been over every week of the study. It was, this was from, uh, from February of 2013 to uh, no, uh, October of 2017. And you can see there was a lot of variation in just crude protein concentration of the diets that we would have fed to these cows if we hadn't adjusted them. And what we ended up doing was in most cases, uh, the diets were lower than, than we uh, than formulated. So we added soybean meal um, to the diets to, to, uh, to, to achieve the, our target crude protein concentration of, of, uh, uh, for each of these experimental diets. And that's the, uh, the, the adjusted uh, concentrations that we achieved, but that was achieved by weekly monitoring the crude protein concentration of the, of, of the diet components that we were feeding and making adjustments. And, it, and it, it call, I think it calls into question how we manage these variations in diet composition that can occur on farm when we're precision feeding cows much closer to the requirements and without a safety factor. So in terms of results, uh, these are the results for dry matter intake. This just shows the dry matter intakes um, over the first, second, and third lactation. And then these are the averages uh, across all, all the lactation for dry matter intake. And you can see that across all three of the, uh, 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 all three lactations, um, the dry matter intake was highest in the cows that were fed the high crude protein diet. But there was not much difference between the, the medium and low protein diets in early and first lactation cows. But in second and third lactation cows, the cows fed the low protein diet did have lower average dry matter intakes. What did that mean in terms of milk yield? Well, in terms of milk yield, there was no difference between uh, milk yields of the, of the cows fed the 16% and the 18% crude protein diet. The cows fed the lower protein diet, the 14% crude pro protein diet. They produced less milk yield, but the loss in milk yield that was observed was not as much as we had predicted when we were uh, working on our um, on on our costings for the study in terms of how much milk we had to uh, refund, uh, how much the value of milk we had to refund to our farm manager, um, but and, and was nowhere near as low as in the study that Ryan Law uh, uh, reported, but. Surprisingly, there was not an increase in milk yield when we fed the higher protein diets. On a 305-day milk yield basis, then uh, you can see, again, there was uh, the 305-day milk yields were lower for the cows fed the 14% crude protein diet, not different in first and second lactation for the 16 and 18% crude protein diets. But by the third lactation, when the cows were mature, then the cows on the 16% crude protein diet actually numerically produce more milk than the cows fed the higher protein diet. And it just shows that we can feed diets that are lower in protein. These, these were lower than what our farm was feeding at the time we started the study. Um, and we can feed even lower protein diets. This, this diet was optimal, but it was optimal by design. And we, we certainly could have, des uh, could have formulated a diet that was lower in protein and still uh, met requirements. There was no effect of these treatments on milk composition except for milk urea. And so the, 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 the milk protein yields of the cows, it pretty much mirrored the, the responses we observed in um, milk yield. Again, the reduction in milk protein yield was not as much as we uh, perhaps had anticipated, but in actual fact, milk protein yield for the cows on the low protein diet was 93% of the milk protein yield of the cows on the 16% crude protein diet. And the diet was formulated to provide 90% of metabolizable protein requirements. So the, form, the diet formulation program we used worked and the cows produced the amount of milk that, or a little bit more milk than they were predicted to, to produce. So what does that mean in terms of uh, nitrogen use efficiency? These are the nitrogen use efficiencies uh, for the study. And you can see that the nitrogen efficiency was of course highest for the cows fed the low protein diet because they were consuming less dietary nitrogen. The efficiency was lowest for the cows that were fed the high protein diet 
because those cows were consuming more uh, dietary nitrogen, they consumed more dry matter intake and had a higher crude protein concentration in that dry matter, but they didn't produce more milk protein. Nitrogen use efficiency decreases as lactation progresses because the milk yield of the cows decreases. We also took sample, well, we, we had a subset of the cows on the study that we used for measurements of, 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 of um, digestion and nitrogen balance. Um, and these measurements were made at an early, mid, and late lactation. And then we took samples of manure from those cows and using a lab-based system, we measured potential ammonia emission from the slurry of those cows. And you can see that substantial amounts of potential slurry emission over three days of measurement from these cows and that it increases as we increase dietary um, uh, crude protein concentration. So these reductions in dietary protein concentration were translating into a reduction in potential slurry ammonia loss uh, over the course of the study. Cows on uh, uh, in the early uh, first lactation, there was less ammonia because they were producing less manure because they were consuming less feed. So one thing that we uh, we were really interested in, and uh, uh, one thing that came out of this study um, was the individual animal variation in nitrogen use efficiency. And so what this shows is the nitrogen use efficiency averaged from six weeks to 34 weeks of lactation for each of the cows on the study in the first, second, and third lactation for the three dietary protein levels. And you can see there's a very substantial range in nitrogen use efficiency within, for, for each of those diets within each of those lactations. And so we're, we're really interested in following up on this and try, uh, interested in determining the sources of that variation in nitrogen use efficiency and think some of it may be due to differences in metabolism of the cows. We took rumen samples from cows that were consistently high and low in nitrogen efficiency on each of the diets and in collaboration with colleagues at SRUC did see that there were differences in microbial communities between those um, cows. And we're, we're also very interested in whether or not this might be a heritable trait that we can select for. Now, one thing that, that contributed to the, that, that variation in nitrogen use efficiency seen in this slide is the fact that cows started this study over a considerable period of time. So, so there's a lot of difference in the actual diets that are being fed to these cows in terms of silage composition, uh, a batch of concentrate they're being fed. So the, there's, there's environmental variation that's contributing to this variation. So to see if we saw, uh, to, to look at this more closely, we did a follow-on trial where we fed similar diets to two groups of cows. This was just 21 cows in mid-lactation. They were on our control 16% crude protein diet. And then we changed them to either the high or the low protein diet and then followed their production over a nine week period. And you can see the nitrogen use efficiency, it dropped in the cows that went to the high protein diet and was maintained fairly constantly for the cows that went to the low protein diet having changed from a 16% crude protein diet. So these cows were being fed diets that were based on exactly the same dietary components, except slight difference in formulation of the concentrate. And what we saw was over the course of the last three weeks of that trial, we saw a similar range in nitrogen efficiency. So very similar to what we observed in the longer, uh, larger longer term study. The, the thing that we also observed is that there was a relationship between protein efficiency and feed efficiency. So the cows that were producing more milk, producing more milk protein, they had a higher feed efficiency. They also had a higher nitrogen use efficiency. So feed efficiency and protein efficiency are related. So when we're, if we're selecting cows for feed efficiency, it, there may also be selection for, for uh, improved protein efficiency as well. And this just shows the relationship between uh, feed efficiency um, and protein efficiency within each of those two diets, the high and the low protein diets. And this, this is, um, this agrees with uh, work that uh, Mike Vanderhaar's student uh, recently published in the journal Dairy Science, looking at the resilience of cows to, to, to being fed lower protein diets. And they found that there was a good relationship between uh, feed efficiency measured as residual feed intake and milk protein efficiency. For, and in this case, these were cows that were either on a high protein diet or on a low protein diet. So this relationship between feed efficiency and protein efficiency is very interesting. And again, something that I think we need to do more work on.
So finally then, just looking at some of the other responses, in terms of body weight, there, 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 there weren't large differences in body weight. One concern when we started the study, some of our, our, our advisory committee were concerned that cows on the low protein diet would become too fat because they weren't, were gonna produce less milk. But the cows that were on the high protein diet did have a higher body weight. And I think it's important to, to remember that one of the responses to dietary protein is often body uh, tissue responses. And so by the end of uh, the third lactation, then cows on the high protein diet weigh 30 kilograms more on average than cows on the, on the low protein diet. There were not large differences in body condition score, uh, so it wasn't significantly affected except in the first lactation when cows on the high protein diet, again, they were consuming more feed and they were producing less milk at a higher body condition score than cows on the 16% uh, the or medium pr uh, protein diet. But those differences were not uh, significant in the second and third lactation. So what did that mean in terms of attrition and fertility of the cows? First of all, uh, to, to, to say we conducted the study using Kaling gates to measure individual cow intakes. And one thing that can happen with Kaling gates is some cows learn how to steal or, or to, to, to what, and what they do is they wait for another cow to open her gate and then they bump her out of the way and jump in and, and, and start feeding before the gate can close. And once a cow learns how to steal, we, they don't unlearn stealing, so they have to be removed from the study. And it was interesting that numerically, we had to remove more cows from the study due to stealing when they were on the low protein diet, which suggests that those cows that were not receiving enough uh, essential amino acids to meet their requirements, we're looking for more protein by trying to steal food from other cows. That's, that's anecdotally, uh, uh, but that's um, uh, what we observed. So if we, if we remove the stealers from the cows remaining on the studies, then we, we didn't see a, a large difference in the number of animals that were, that, that were culled or died, uh, any casualties, but we did observe that there were more abortions in the cows that were fed the low protein diet. And uh, this, this, these numbers do not include uh, embryo losses. And we also had a, a, a higher number of cows that lost embryos on the low protein diet. We didn't include those in the numbers because those cows were often rebred and then stayed on the study. So just in terms of uh, the number of cows that would have continued into their fourth lactation, um, and we average about four lactations per cow in terms of longevity in our herd, we, only about 35% or a, roughly a third would have continued their fourth lactation when they were fed the low protein diet. But cows on the medium or high protein diet, almost 50% of those cows uh, would have continued uh, to a, a fourth lactation. So there was a reduction in, or an increase in attrition. And that's just shown in this, life, uh, this survival plot for the study. And you can see the cows that, in yellow on the low protein diet where we had, had uh, increasingly uh, more uh, attrition over the, over the life of the study um, due to the cows being underfed protein. We did some economic modeling in terms of the results, uh, just a, a sim fairly simple financial model of, 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 the dairy in, of a dairy enterprise uh, to examine the effect of these changes in protein, looking at variable and fixed costs. Um, and as you would expect, the medium protein ration generated the highest net margin because variable costs were increased with uh, both the high and the low protein diet. Uh, there were higher feed costs with the higher protein diet, uh, but a, a big impact with the low protein diet was the increase in replacement costs. That had the biggest impact on economics of uh, our economic modeling was replacement costs. Um, and there were also increases in veterinary and medical costs for cows on the, on the low protein group. And that, that was associated with more milk dumping as well. So what did we learn from the trial? It was a fairly simple uh, feeding trial, for, but it was a long-term trial, which I think made it unique. Uh, certainly lower protein diets were more nitrogen efficient, but I think it's important we consider those long-term effects at a systems level. There were economic implications and also environmental implications. And again, I think some of those environmental in, in, benefits uh, we need to start thinking about uh, putting an economic value or a, va a greater value on those e environmental benefits. We did observe a high degree of animal variation in nitrogen use efficiency, which I think we need to, to do more work on. 
And certainly if we underfeed cows protein or, 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 or if we're precision feeding cows and we, uh, we unavoidably uh, underfeed protein, then there is a risk of reduced uh, milk yield certainly, and also in the longer term, reduced fer fertility and survival. We did see a large variation in our diet uh, components in terms of protein concentrations. And uh, I think this does have implications for pre precision feeding cows, lower protein diets, and certainly longer term negative effects of suboptimal protein were, were, were evident in our trial. Uh, the, our 16% crude protein diet in this study was optimal, but that was by design. And again, we could have certainly designed diets that were lower in protein that would have met the cow's requirements. So some of the questions I think are, are uh, we're really interested in reasons for that variation uh, between animals and nitrogen use efficiency and its links to overall feed efficiency. Um, we, 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 it's, I think it's interesting that we saw a similar degree of variation across treatments. And I think in looking at the data further, we need to make adjustments uh, for milk yield uh, as we would with residual feed intake. I think there, there, there may well be genetic components, both in terms of the animal, but also in terms of the rumen microbial communities. I think it's important that we consider how to address variations in diet composition that can occur. And, and, and determine whether those day-to-day -day variations matter uh, and what precision technologies we might be able to use to, to help manage uh, uh, rations in, in the longer term. Um, one concern here in the UK is often uh, having higher, if we take protein out, what are we replacing it with? And if we're going to try to improve efficiency by having, having higher starch levels or sugars, then what negative impacts might that have? Here in the UK, we tend to use uh, wheat or barley as sources of, of starch, which is uh, more degradable, uh, and so I have to be carefully managed. And then what, what's the role of rumen undegraded protein or rumen protected proteins and, and amino acids in, in, in formulating diets that are lower in protein and still meet requirements? And I think there's a lot of opportunity there. So to finish, just some take-home me messages. We know, I mean, I know there's a lot of this going on already in the industry. Uh, that we can formulate diets that are lower in protein concentrations, that meet requirements, uh, and, and with due consideration for essential amino acid requirements. Uh, energy supplies really, I think it's, it's important in terms of maximizing dietary nitrogen efficiency, uh, and, it's, and it is linked to milk protein yield and therefore feed efficiency. I think uh, precision feeding lower protein diets is, is, is something we're going to do more and more. Uh, and, but there are challenges in terms of variation in feed composition we need to address. And there is a risk of undersupplying essential amino acids that could, could reduce survival and certainly reduce milk yield. But uh, finally, I, th I think we need to consider nitrogen efficiency or protein efficiency on a systems basis, not just on, a, on an individual cow basis. And, 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 and we need to balance the potential benefits and risks. Um, and we don't. We also need to consider other aspects of our production systems, especially forage production, fertilizer and slurry uh, use, and heifer rearing diets as well, because they're all part of our production systems. And with that, I hope I haven't taken too long, and I'd be really happy to take any questions. Thanks very much for listening. Thank you, Chris. Uh, before we get started answering questions, we'd like to share a brief video, and then we'll be right back to answer the questions submitted during today's presentation. With today's low milk prices and rising feed protein costs, now is the time to turn up the dial on rumen efficiency. NitroSure, Precision Release Nitrogen, is designed to help stabilize rumen ammonia pools by synchronizing carbohydrate and nitrogen availability to the microflora. Providing a consistent supply of ammonia is proven to increase rumen microbial populations, improve fiber and dry matter digestibility, and stimulate microbial protein yield, all leading to greater efficiencies in forage utilization and higher milk and milk component production. Maximize rumen microflora with NitroSure to turn up rumen efficiency and productivity. As a reminder, you can still submit questions through the questions pane in your attendee control panel. Uh, Dr. Reynolds, our first question comes in from uh, Eric. 
Eric is asking for the three lactation study, dietary starch content decreased as crude protein content increased. Do you think any of the measured outcomes would be different if starch content was held similar across uh, diets? That's a really good question. And, and we, I spent so much time look, uh, working on those diets and thinking about how to formulate them. Um, and uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, if we had had more fermentable energy, then I think we could have achieved more metabolizable protein perhaps without, uh, the, the diets, were Eric, were based on a previous study we conducted and it, where we had similar differences in diet crude protein concentration, but we had used some ruminant protected protein sources to, to try to, 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 to mani help manipulate metabolizable protein supply. Um, I can't go into all the details, but for a number of reasons, we decided to keep the diet simple and not include any room protected proteins. Um, the other, the other sort of um, almost political issue we had in terms of the study design was concerns uh, over uh, levels of starch in our rations at the time uh, in our commercial herd. Uh, and so the diets, we, I know looking at them from, at the diets from a North American perspective, um, they're relatively low in starch, uh, but for, for, for the UK, they were considered very high starch levels. And so, uh, uh, you know, there were concerns being expressed about uh, rumen acidosis and things like that, which is one reason the starch levels aren't higher than they were. But it's a really good question. All right, next question comes from John from Canada. You mentioned the possibility that high N efficiency might be heritable. Um, and my question just moved on me. Okay, here it is. Uh, that uh, N efficiency might be heritable. What proportion do you think that could be bovine genetics and what from microbiota? Work in uh, Wisconsin suggests in big impacts from the initial microbial population coming from the dam. Yes, I mean, it's a really good point. And I think, you know, how, I think a big question, question a really interesting question is how heritable are rumen microbial communities? Um, you know, the, through heritable differences in the cow's physiology uh, that, that, um, that influence, um, the rumen microbial communities, uh, you know, I'm thinking specifically here of the work in Australia where they were selecting against bloat and hypothesizing that there were differences in, in microbial inhibitors in saliva or, or factors in saliva that were influencing mi microbial communities to explain how they were able to select against bloat. Um, and, and uh, you know, I think we've got a similar situation with feed efficiency in terms of uh, differences in mi microbial communities that are related to um, uh, feed efficiency. And, and so, yeah, it's a really good question. Uh, the other aspect, of course, is, is where the inoculation of the rumen comes from. If it comes from the dam, you know, is the dam passing on her microbes to the rumen of, 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 of the offspring? Um, depending on how the animal's managed when it's born. Uh, but I, th I think it's true, there are truly heritable comp components to rumen microbial communities based on what I've seen and people I've talked to. All right, thank you. Next question comes from Glenn. Could you comment on Mark Hennigan's description of the new NASM system saying that all essential amino acids, especially the five essential amino acids, influence milk protein yield and that the concept um, and that the concept of single limiting um, essential amino acids is now passe. That's a good point. That's a good point. Um, uh, I've been hearing Mark uh, Mark's story on this for a number of years, uh, and I think it's 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 a really good point. Uh, and I think you know Kelly's perhaps Kelly's Nichols data that I showed uh, you know help, might agree with with that with that concept. Um, and I think it's 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 based on responses to, not to single amino acids, but to uh, responses to um, uh, mixtures of amino acids. Um, and so, so yeah, I think, um, I'm not sure what, what I can say about it other than I, I don't disagree with the concept. 
All right, thank you. Stacy is asking, what are the reasons for the variation in diet composition over the course of our long-term trial, and how should we deal with variations in diet composition in the field? Yeah, that's a really good point. I mean, our biggest concern was our grass silage. Uh, we, at, at our commercial farm, we milk about 550 cows annually, um, and uh, we we use clamps for our silage. So, and in, in, well, when I was growing up, I would have called them a trench silo. Um, and um, so very large uh, volumes of, of, of forage that are ensiled. And particularly our, while our maize is harvested uh, fairly quickly uh, and is relatively, well, it's much more homogeneous in terms of composition from year to year. Our grass silage is harvested at different times of the year. And so it goes into our grass clamps and wedges. Uh, and so as we work back through the clamp, we can have really large variation in silage quality for, for our grasses. And um, so I, we were most worried about grass silage uh, variation and how to deal with that. And it was, it, it was quite substantial. Uh, and a big part of the issue was our grass silage uh, quality or composition. Um, but we were also feeding a blend, which again in UK speak means it, it's a mixture of concentrates. It wasn't mil milled, sorry. Um, so it, it, it wasn't as homogeneous as a pellet or a, a, a milled uh, mixture of concentrates. And so there was, there were, for example, you know, we, we can have clumps of rapeseed meal, or we can have, if, if we, if we, where we included, um, soy holes, they, they might have been pelleted soy holes. And so it's difficult, to, one, one thing it's difficult to sample uh, and get a representative sample. We, you know, we're a researcher, so we do a pretty good job. Um, uh, but it, it, it contributed to some of that variation, the, the real variation. Um, and so partway through the study, we made some changes in how that blend was being produced. And you'll see in the, in the figures that the variation tended to go down slightly. And that's due to a difference in, in how we were having our supplier uh, manage that blend. We were still using a blend. We, we did that to save costs. We were feeding a third of the herd over, over you know, a number of years. And, and it was, was it, you know, we were trying to control costs and dust in terms of supply and concentrate to the cows. So in terms of managing it, I don't know. We initially we looked at handheld NIR as a potential way of of, of keeping track of of our for, especially our forage composition, uh, but also and and we looked at various uh, the the use of NIR. But in the end, we decided just to use Keldahl in our own lab, uh, and and that's how we approached it. But I think I think you know the rapid analysis uh, and and on farm analysis or handheld equipment like an in, handheld NIR is 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 you know has a lot of potential in terms of helping to manage uh, or keep track of diet quality. All right, thank you for that last part. I think you answered uh, Glenn's question. Um, we've got a question coming in from Colin. Is there an individual cow test that can be used to assess which cows are the most efficient during lactation? Oh, that's a, well, that's a good question. Uh, in terms of efficiency, um, just thinking about nitrogen efficiency, of course, you know, we have milk urea nitrogen. Um, and within individual studies, there, there's, and it, certainly in our study, there's a good relationship between milk urea nitrogen and nitrogen efficiency, certainly at, 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 a, at a group level. But um, it's, you know, there are other, a number of other factors that can affect milk urea nitrogen. Um, and so it has limitations as, as a proxy or as a biomarker. Um, we're part of a EU project called SmartCal, um, which is, and one of the things we're working on in that project is the development of biomarkers or proxies for s some of our measurements of sustainability, like nitrogen efficiency or feed efficiency. And so one thing that colleagues in that smart cow project have been um, using or, or exploring um, in addition to things like fecal NIR analysis is um, N15 discrimination between 
uh, N15 labeling of the feed and N15 labeling of uh, the milk or uh, plasma of the cows. And it tends to be a better uh, biomarker for nitrogen efficiency of lactating cows in established lactation. It, 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 statistically, it's better than milk urea nitrogen. Um, a limitation is cows in early lactation where you have um, labile protein supplies from the cow that are being utilized. And so that's diluting or impacting that differential in N15 labeling. So, and there, there's a lot of interest in other potential um, components of the milk metabolome uh, that could that have potential, uh, and the, but it's a, a very active area of research. But N15 labeling and the discrimination between the cow's um, protein, milk, say milk protein or plasma protein and feed protein, um, because it's affected by catabolism of amino acids, uh, it has a lot of promise as a biomarker. Thank you. <clears throat> Next question comes from Weebin. What's the impact of low protein treatments on body protein reserves and protein related functions of the cow? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, and we, 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 we did do measurements of nitrogen balance in, in a subset of our cows and, um, you know, measured body protein retention or loss in those cows. Um, of course, there's, you know, it's, those measurements are very difficult to conduct without uh, unavoidable losses of, of volatile nitrogen occurring. And so, you know, uh, there's a lot of discussion around uh, our measurements of nitrogen retention in cows um, using digestion trial approaches. Um, and so, and we, we've we've got those, so we've got those data, and and there are, there, there are effects. Um, uh, in terms of other functions of the cow, I think you know an example is fertility. Um, you know we did see it's you know even, I mean ours was a relatively large study for a nutrition study, but for a reproduction study we had a limited number of cows. It was you know only 215 cows, and uh, you know and and 70 slightly over 70 per treatment. Um, so, but we did have numerical differences in embryo loss and abortions in cows that were underfed protein. And, and so I think that's a, that's a real risk. And this is an example of a, of a function of the cow. The other one is immune responses. And, you know, we, we did tend to have more veterinary treatments um, for cows on the low protein diet. So, which, you know, it's in going in the direction, but not enough data to show a, a significant effect. All right, my next I hope question. that answered the question, Scott. Yeah, I think it did. Uh, next question comes in from Leandro from Argentina. In the three-year study, you showed around 10 points of nitrogen use efficiency among individual animals, independently of treatment and year. The question is, across the years, in each treatment, more or less efficient animals continued being the same? And that's a question. Oh, it's a really, uh, thank you. That's a really good question, because that's something we, we did look at. And, and um, in some cases, yes, in some cases, no. And then it's a, I think it's a question of, of why would a cow be efficient in her first lactation and less, you know, relative to her, her study mate, so to speak, less efficient in her second lactation. So, so for the cows that we sample for rumen fluid from, we chose cows, and this, this happens, you know, about two thirds of the way through the study, we started looking at this and getting really interested in it. And um, so we chose cows that were, had been more efficient in the first and second lactation or less efficient in the first and second lactation. As to why, I mean, it, it could be related to factors that might have affected the cow's milk yield uh, because a big, you know, that nitrogen efficiency I showed was, was just gross nitrogen efficiency. It's milk protein yield uh, divide, converted to, nit to a nitrogen basis divided by um, feed nitrogen intake. And so, uh, uh, a really important component of that is 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 milk yield of the cows, and we know some cows, you know, because something that happened at calving or whatever, uh, poor transition, whatever, uh, could have a lower milk yield in, in in a subsequent lactation than in, in than in a previous lactation. 
So part of it could be related to that. But it's a really good question, and it's something that that we should look into more in more detail. All right, thank you for that. Uh, Clayton wants to know if you observed any unusual behaviors such as urine drinking and cows fed the low protein diets. Oh, well, the, I mean, uh, as you know, I mean, I, I was really interested in the um, in the stealing one, you know, because there's studies in, in other species that have shown that you know, cat, and sheep. There's studies in sheep that's shown that they will voluntarily select voluntarily select diets that um, that balance rumen degradable protein and fermentable energy. And studies in rats that shown that they will select diets that that uh, meet their essential amino acid requirements. So, you know, my my it, it, you know my first reaction was, well, we've got more stealers on that diet because they're looking for protein. In terms of other um, traits, I, I did, nobody came to me and said, we've got cows drinking urine. Uh, so uh, the answer is, I don't know. Uh, but I will, I will, uh, I think, I think our research uh, crew would have told me if they'd observed anything, but I will ask them the question. It's All right, thank you. Yep, we're well past our uh, the top of the hour here, so we're not going to be able to get to all the questions. We will answer uh, the ones that we we didn't get to uh, during the the upcoming podcast. Um, so we have time for one last one. Sylvia wants to know, from a milk nitrogen efficiency standpoint, is there an uh, optimal legume forage to corn silage ratio in the diet? Oh. A good question. Uh, obviously, it's going to depend on the composition of the, you know, uh, of, of of that legume silage, presumably lucerne, um, and uh, and and the may the corn silage. Uh, sorry, presumably alfalfa uh, or and corn silage. So um, I think I'm. I'm, I'm sorry, Scott. I, I I couldn't you know put my hand up and say I would recommend this ratio. Uh, it's going to depend on uh, you know uh, the com the composition of that of that legume uh, forage makes perfect sense, and, yeah. and I thank you for that, um, yeah. Chris. Thank you for today's presentation, and thank you everyone for attending today's webinar. If you have additional questions, please submit them to anh.marketing at balchem.com and we'll answer them for you. The Real Science Lecture Series uh, of webinars continues with the new and timely topics of the Rumen audience on the first Tuesday of every month. Visit balchem.com slash real science for more details and to register. Balchem's podcast series continues to offer a deeper dive into our webinar topics. Tonight, our first producer poker focused uh, podcast will air. Taped during the this last week's World Dairy Expo, we sit down with three icons uh, in the dairy industry, Mr. Jim Ostrom, uh, Mr. Jonathan Lamb, and Mr. Pat Maddox. Over the next month, we will also be sharing a podcast around each of the NRC webinars completed just a few weeks ago. Visit balchem.com slash podcast or subscribe to the Real Science Exchange on your favorite podcast platform to listen. Don't forget to request your Real Science Exchange t-shirt. Learn how at balchem.com slash podcast. On behalf of Balchem and Dr. Reynolds, thank you for joining us today.